Hey everyone, no copyright infringement intended caboose here. We're doing something a little different today, more of the behind the scenes of Battlefield Operation. This is one of those systems that you notice most often when it isn't doing its job, cooling. Cools weapons, reactors, engines, even pilots and crew. Now, calling Battlefield cooling systems heat sinks is a bit of a misnomer. It's not just slapping a huge chunk of metal that has fins machined out of it on a component and calling it good. That's what old school computer heat sinks were long before room temperature superconductors were designed that modern processors are built out of. That's something we'll dive into a bit later. And that's really all the intro I need, honestly. Cooling systems are used everywhere, not just in mechs. In fact, the smaller in scale you go, the more critical their peak efficiency becomes. Cooling ties in closely with your average life support and climate control as well. Think your typical office buildings, space stations, and spaceships. Granted, interstellar vehicles benefit from having enormous surface area to radiate away heat, but the downside of that for military vehicles is that makes them even easier to spot via infrared in space. Without too much further exposition, let's jump in. Refrigeration has been important since people wanted to store food for longer than a day or so. In fact, largely by trial and error, people in the early days of human exploration figured out that you could eat meat that we would today consider expired within reason. The downside was that it would taste awful, and during this period salts and spices became more expensive than gold because that's all that would cover up the taste. Around the beginning of the 20th century, giant ass coolers were made that could make warehouses full of giant blocks of ice. These would be cut up and delivered door to door for people to put in insulated chests that stored food. Every day you'd put a 20 kilo block of ice to keep your food from spoiling, and every morning someone would have to deliver a fresh one. As you can imagine, this was less than efficient or ideal. Then, someone invented the first personal refrigeration unit for storage, largely just referred to as a fridge. Early models worked by compressing a gas into a liquid, bleeding off that heat outside the cooled area, and decompressing it inside through a radiator with a fan blowing on it. This would allow cooling below ambient temperatures to a significant degree. These early models used something like methylformate or methyl chloride, which had a major downside. A leak would kill you. Not might, or could, would kill you. After a decent number of incidents where a fridge sprung a leak and whole families got snuffed out, industry leaders listened to their advisors warning them that making products which killed their users wasn't the way to go, and coolants evolved into something far less lethal. These coolants, while completely non-toxic and non-combustible, had a different downside. They quickly ate holes in the early ozone layer. There's a phenomenon when trying to come up with viable cooling solutions that the average person can use. The less toxic and volatile the coolant is, the more flammable it becomes. In the early 21st century, they settled on isobutane, which while totally non-toxic and relatively environmentally neutral, was also highly combustible. One alternative to chemical-based cooling solutions was something called the Peltier or Thermoelectric Cooler. This used differing materials sandwiching an insulator between them. When one side was kept hot and the other cold, it would produce a small but measurable electric current. However, when you applied current to it instead, one side would become cold far below the ambient temperature and the other side extremely hot. This became an exciting development as there are many places that housing some kind of suffocating or combustible gas was not feasible, but had ample supply of electricity. The downside of this technology is that at the time it was incredibly inefficient. It was to the point that putting a water circulating radiator was preferable to trying to power one of these units unless there was no other option. Now in modern times we're spoiled for choice when it comes to coolants and cooling systems. Thermoelectric systems are still more energy intensive than mechanical systems, but the gap has largely been narrowed. We have liquid coolants for cooling things to ambient temperatures. We have gaseous coolants for subambient thing things like carbon dioxide, nitrogen, helium, some people are even daring enough to use petroleum-based solutions because of their low cost. In space, they have the advantage of needing to keep the ship warm for the crew and or passengers, which requires a lot of heat. However, when working hard, there's still waste heat to deal with. Civilian ships can just loop coolant throughout the hull and take advantage of the mass's surface area to radiate it away. However, once you throw weapons into the mix, that becomes suboptimal. Heat sinks on spaceships are much more massive and complex than on ground vehicles, but we're just going to focus on terrestrial uses for now. None of these options I listed are exactly better or worse than the other, each one has pros and cons. Once you get to the battlefield use, though, viable selection narrows enormously. Wait, what's the opposite of enormously?
The selection narrows hideously. So, picture this. You're in a giant walking tank, minding your own business, when some other mech- Dirty Capellans. When some Capellan- Yes! Takes a shot at you. Now, most of the time you let things like that go, but because- It was a Capellan caboose. Yes, they know. Because of that, you feel inclined to return fire. Suddenly, your cockpit is a sauna and things aren't running as smoothly as they should. Look, you can't blame me because your coolant vest doesn't work right. I'm not the one using it to make illicit hooch this time. Moving on. Just as suddenly, you feel something run through the vest you're wearing that's at least 20 degrees cooler than the environment outside your mech, and shortly after that, systems start behaving like they should. Cooling systems are reactive. Battle mechs have enormous surface area for dissipating heat to start with, and the fusion reactors that power them are incredibly efficient. Just moving around, even using jump jets, isn't enough to make any mech start to overrun its heat cooling capacity. As soon as you throw any weapons into the mix, that all changes. The most demanding weapons to cool are energy-based ones. Lasers and PPCs turn energy into highly focused destructive power. The side effect of this is that things like focusing lenses, field generators, and capacitors are all literally red hot the second they fire. Material engineering has allowed for this, but no one wants a weapon they can only fire once. Heavy lasers from the clans are even worse. Part of the reason they're so fucking huge is the need for advanced insulation and cooling loops integral to the weapon, and even then they're a hair's breadth away from frying your sensors at every shot. But even ballistic or missile weapons need help. An AC-20 or LRM-15 generate a lot of heat in a small area just from burning propellants. Autocannons have jacketed barrels, LRMs and SRMs have a complex system of coolant lines built in to keep all the launch tubes cool enough to prevent galling as the missile slides out. Even Gauss rifles, one of the coolest weapons you can mount on a combat unit, need some help. You discharge an imperial fuckton of energy into some magnets in a fraction of a second and shit gets hot. If you want to fire it again sometime that same calendar week, it's gotta get cooled externally. Red hot laser apertures, smoking autocannon barrels, sparking PPC emitters, they all make for a great holovid. You will never see these things in real life. Why? Because if they ever got to that point, one of two things has happened. One, the mech warrior is a dumbass and hacked the weapon for a faster firing rate, or B, the cooling designer for that weapon is a dumbass and has probably already been fired. So, how does coolant make it around the mech? Well, Succession War era mechs do tend to use things like compressors and circulating liquid coolant. This is fucking awful. Do not do this. However, if you do need to go this route, our cooling system and HVAC expert Dashstar can give you a little insight onto how this kind of cooling loop works. Hey everyone, to keep it as simple as possible, low-tech or succession work cooling systems were a combination of liquid cooling and heat pumps. They circulate some kind of high boiling point liquid, usually a glycol of some sort, all around the hot spots of the mech. Then, at select spots, a heat pump would siphon heat out of the main cooling loop and dissipate it overboard. How this works is usually some kind of purpose-made refrigerant, which is compressed from a low temperature gas to a high temperature liquid. Then, the heat from the liquid is bled off outside the mech and is pumped to the hot side of the system where the liquid cooling loop is. On the way through a different pipe or heat exchange geometry, the pressure on that liquid is reduced until it evaporates. Because of thermodynamics, this means that as it expands into a gas, it rapidly cools down. Then it filters through the heat exchanger and is heated up until it's close to its original starting temperature. It goes from there into the compressor and the cycle starts over again. Mechs now used advanced coolants and circulating methods. They tend to use things like heavy silicone or hydrocarbon-based oils moving through tubes of flexible polymers or mimers. The mimers contract and move the coolant along, kind of like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. This is an incredibly effective and efficient way to move gases and liquids, with the fringe benefit of being able to pinch off damaged portions not unlike a severed artery or vein. Those now heated oils are moved to where the heat exchanger is located. Like the Succession War era technology, this uses more common refrigerants to cool the oil quickly, which boils the liquid of choice, that gets cooled by a heat pump and condensed. The heat that this gives off is bled into the surrounding environment via radiation and convection using giant radiators. Tanks also use these systems, but conventional vehicles that aren't fusion power don't need to. 
Because their straightforward design lends itself to things like radiators and natural air cooling, really all they need to cool are energy weapons. They'll just have a cooling jacket on whatever weapon needs it in a nearby radiator. Everything else gets a pass and gets integrated with the engine cooling system. One of the main goals of a cooling loop is to keep the pilot and or crew in comfortable conditions. In fact, this is so essential that mechs have a dedicated auxiliary cooling system specifically for this purpose. It's built into the life support system and in the event that the mech goes offline, it has enough power to keep the pilot alive and comfortable for some time. The radiators themselves are straightforward in design but use more advanced materials than the old school aluminum, copper, or steel. Single strength heat sinks are still by far the most common and they're made of a specially oriented graphite material for maximum heat dissipation in a small package. Double heat sinks use a crystalline polymer similar to XL engine shielding. It's not as conductive as the graphite used on the single models, but it's much lighter and stronger, allowing for the construction of a much larger radiator at the same weight, dissipating twice as much heat. In inner sphere mechs, these take up three times as much space. In clan mechs, they only take up twice as much space due to their perfecting of the construction process. The advantage of a heat exchanger slash heat pump setup as opposed to straight up radiators is that heat pumps can cool things below ambient temperatures, just like your food chiller. External temperatures still affect them, making them more or less efficient, sure, but overall they allow the mech to cool systems to subambient temperatures, in essence giving them a little bit of breathing room for when they do inevitably start to heat up. This brings us to our last point, enhancing your cooling system. All kinds of tips and tricks exist that will make your mech cool faster. The most common one is to find a body of water and submerge your mech at least halfway in it. The cooling fans are capable of moving water over the radiators as well as air, and the density of the water easily doubles the efficiency of the heat exchangers that are submerged. Coolant pods exist that house highly compressed gases that, when released into their own system of pipes and pumps into heat exchangers, have roughly the same effect as being underwater, though much shorter lived. This at least gives a mech a quick cooldown burst, though if it's hit by weapons fire before being triggered, it's also like having a small bomb in the heart of your mech. So, you know, trade offs. Most of us know about your typical double and single heat sinks. When designing a mech, like talking strategy or theory, there's a formula that reduces heat from temperature to single points. This makes it much easier and more intuitive to review and discuss. For example, a bog standard intersphere small laser produces three heat. Running produces two, and from a battlefield standpoint, standing still produces none. A single heat sink dissipates one, and a double two. What about other heat sink types? Well, towards the end of the Star League, and shortly after the memory core was recovered off helm, there were prototype double heat sinks. These had the same weight and, more importantly, the same size as their single strength counterparts. However, they were, shall we say, unpredictable. Rather than the unreactive gases or liquids we're used to, these used coolants like liquefied sodium for their amazing conductivity and thermal mass. The downside, for those of you that weren't paying attention to your basic chemistry lessons, is that sodium reacts with water in any form to produce hydrogen and a ton of heat. The warmer the metal, the faster it reacts. The more metal there is, the more likely for an energetic reaction or, in the more common vernacular, a huge fucking kaboom. When one of these radiators or hoses sprung a leak in an environment containing a lot of water, or hell, even just high humidity, you got a large bang, a chain reaction inside the mech, a rolling fireball, and liquid metal splattering everywhere that was hot enough to etch aluminum. Going in the other direction, we have compact heat sinks. Dissipating one heat point just like singles, they also occupied half the space, meaning you could double stack the radiators for double the cooling. Downside was that they weighed another 500 kilos more. With more heat producing weaponry, these became a boon to heavy and assault mechs that oftentimes had the tonnage to spare, but not the internal space. The last heat sink type comes from the Jade Falcons on their Night Gear, or Geyer, or Gear, however you pronounce that. This is the laser heat sink. This is also the only mech that ever used them. Laser heat sinks use, well, lasers to add energy to exhaust gases and infrared heat and excite them into a higher energy visible state. Then they use mirrors or polished surfaces to bounce the light outside the mech. From a design and repair perspective, this makes the mech much easier to build and maintain. There's no need for coolants, plumbing, or cooling jackets, or radiators. By eliminating interior plumbing to move heat around, this also meant that the other systems would stay cooler, most notably ammo. While not completely negating ammo explosions, this 
this did make them a rare event. It also made the rate of heat dissipation constant, which made the mech largely immune to flamers and fires, two of the favorite elements of anti-clan tactics. It also meant the mech saw no bonus from parking it in water, and if it was shut down, the rate of heat dissipation became much slower. It also lit up the exhausting areas like their own laser light show. At lower heat levels it wasn't too bad, but it lit up the night like a 70 ton moving disco, and it made covert operations a poor role for this mech. So in summary, cooling makes the Sphere go round and has for over a millennia. Buildings, ground vehicles, combat vehicles, battle armor, VTOLs, aircraft, aerospace fighters, interstellar ships, and even environmental suits and shelters all depend on an efficient cooling system made with robust materials and redundant backups. I'm trying to keep these releases on a regular schedule, but life has gotten in the way and I would much rather take a longer time on each video than compromise my quality standards. That being said, next up is all about energy weapons. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, maybe I'll see you on the battlefield.